Leonardo da Vinci, in the term Renaissance, the designation historians have given uh, to the period during which Leonardo, 1452 to 1519, lived, have become inextricably woven together. <clears throat> Who is our early Leonardo called the quintessential Renaissance man? And who can pretend to even a casual knowledge of the European Renaissance without knowing something of the accomplishments of Leonardo, the man in the time that maintained their hold on us? The seeds of science and technology, which germinated and flowered in the scientific revolution of the 17th century, were planted in the Italian Renaissance of the 15th century and no one sowed more of the seeds of Leonardo. He's so far ahead of us that had most of his uh, material disappeared. Uh, he wrote thousands of uh, books, you know, uh, which indicated different kinds of scientific inventions. Uh, it was, had these books remained, the Industrial Revolution might have come earlier. We may be even further ahead, technologically speaking, but uh, most of the stuff disappeared. But what he has done, what we do know about him, is quite remarkable. The Italian Renaissance was a period in Europe that was intellectually expansive, reaching back to recover the art, philosophy, and literature of the ancients, but also taking the first steps into a new kind of human future. In Western intellectual history, the Renaissance period stretching from the beginning of the 15th to the end of the 16th century, marks the period of transition from the Middle Ages to the modern world. In the 1460s, when the young Leonardo da Vinci receives his training as a painter, sculptor, and engineer in Florence, the worldview of his contemporaries is still entangled in medieval things. No, this morning. Science. The panel. I'm sorry. I can't. The panel. Oh, well. Just pass it along, that book. Science of the modern sense as a systematic empirical method for gaining knowledge about the natural world did not exist. Knowledge about natural phenomena, some accurate, some inaccurate, had been handed down by Aristotle. Everything was Aristotle in those days until he started changing things. Um, and other philosophers of antiquity was fused with Christian doctrine by the scholastic theologians who presented it as the officially authorized creed. So uh, science was that's something that is as it is today, for sure. The authorities condemned scientific experiments as subversive, seeing any attack on Aristotle's science as an attack on the church. Uh, Leonardo broke with this tradition. The first comprehensive designs for the future are found in his notebooks 100 years before Galileo and Bacon. He single-handedly developed a new empirical approach to science involving the systematic observation of nature, logical reason, reasoning and some mathematical formulations. The main characteristics of what is known today is the scientific method. He was much, very much into observation and he wanted to know why things are the way they are. He fully realized that he was breaking new ground. He humbly called himself an unlettered man with some irony and with pride in his new method, seeing himself as an interpreter between nature and humans. Wherever he turned, there were new discoveries to be made in scientific creativity, combining ingenuity, was the main driving force throughout his life. 35 years after the completion of the famous dome of Santa del Fiorio, uh, he went to Florence as a major building. It was uh, done by the Medici family. Very impressive. Um, Andrea del Verrocchio, Verrocchio workshop was awarded the contract to place a gilded ball measuring eight feet <coughs> in diameter on top of the dome. Verrocchio's 19-year-old apprentice Leonardo was intimately involved in this effort. On May 29, 1471, Leonardo climbed to the top of the dome and assisted in putting the ball in place. His lifelong obsession with engineering may have begun with this project. He was an incredibly great engineer, way ahead of his time. Little is known about the early years of Leonardo's life. The few reliable facts are often tantalizingly suggestive as to his later development and the evolution of his interests. Far more, far more can be said with conviction about Leonardo the man, a great deal based on his own words, 
but the frustrations to penetrate his obscure boyhood never completely disappears. At the beginning of his life, Leonardo evades us. Nonetheless, the most fascinating figure of the Renaissance was born on April 15, 1452, near the village of Vinci, some 60 miles from Florence. His mother was a peasant girl, Caterina, who did not marry Leonardo's father, Piero D'Antonio, who was a Florentine attorney of some means. The year of Leonardo's birth, Piero married a woman of his own rank. Leonardo's mother had to be content with a peasant husband, and subsequent to Leonardo's birth, she transferred her love child to Piero and his wife. And Leonardo was brought up in semi-aristocratic comfort <clears throat> without much maternal nurturing. Now, that's debatable, but anyway. Perhaps in that early environment, he acquired his taste for fine clothing and his aversion to women. That's also very debatable, but scholars, you know, have drawn out different ideas about his life. He went to a neighborhood school, took finally to mathematics, music, and drawing, and delighted his father by his singing and his playing of the lute. In order to draw well, he studied all things in nature with curiosity, patience, and care. Science and art, so remarkably united in his mind, uh, had one major origin, detailed observation. Uh, that differed from Aristotle. Uh, his point of view, which was very intuitive and uh, not always very accurate. When he was turning 15, his father took him to Braccio's studio in Florence and persuaded that versatile artist to accept him as an apprentice. Will Durant, in his book, The Renaissance, relates that, quote, all the educated world knows the story of how Leonardo painted the angel at the left, his Braccio's baptism of Christ. Now the master was so overwhelmed by the beauty of the figure that he gave up painting and devoted himself to sculpture. Meanwhile, Sir Piero prospered, bought several properties, moved family to Florence in 1469, and married four wives in subsequent order. His second wife is only 10 years older than Leonardo. When the third wife presented Piero with a child, Leonardo eased the congestion by going to live with Veraccio. In that year, 1472, Leonardo was admitted to membership in the company of St. Luke. This guild, composed chiefly of apothecaries, physicians, and artists, had its headquarters in the, hosp in the hospital of Santa Maria Nuova. Presumably, uh, Leonardo was secretive about his scientific work, although he intended to eventually publish the results of his investigations. He kept them hidden away during his entire life, apparently out of fear that his ideas might be stolen. Essentially, the main reason Leonardo did not share his scientific knowledge with others, although he shared his knowledge of painting, obviously, with fellow artists and disciples, was that he regarded it as his intellectual capital, the basis of his skills in engineering and stagecraft, which were the main sources of his regular income. He must have feared that sharing this, knowledge about, uh, this body of knowledge would have diminished the chances of steady employment. The professional artist in the Renaissance had to be much more than just an artist. Uh, very often the workshop of a busy artist was uh, an admirable place for you know, uh, course, curious young men to meet and study the practical problems of nature, the elements, physics in all its branches, uh, geometry, their applications to the practical needs of his society. And to these studies, <clears throat> Leonardo added a deep interest in pure and applied mathematics. Somewhere he came upon a copy of the works of Archimedes, and he knew the elements of Euclid by heart, so although he was, uh, he was really self-taught, but the guy was you know, all over the place. He was so convinced by the primacy of mathematics in all scientific works that he wrote in his notebook that, quote, no one should bother to read my principles who is not a mathematician, unquote. But indeed, he was interested in everything, all postures and actions of the human body, uh, uh, the elevation of the mountains, uh, uh, erosion, the currents and eddies of water and wind, the shades of the atmosphere, inexhaustible kaleidoscope of the sky. All these seemed endlessly wonderful to him. Repetition never dulled for him their marvel and mystery. He filled thousands of pages with observations concerning them and drawings of their myriad forms. Quote, when the monks of San Scopito asked him to paint a picture for the chapel in 1481, he made so many sketches for so many features and forms that he lost himself in the details and never finished the adoration of the Magi. Will Durant points out that 
Nevertheless, it is one of his greatest paintings, the place for which he developed and was drawn on a strictly geometrical pattern of perspective with a whole space divided into diminishing squares. The mathematician and Leonardo always competed, often cooperated, cooperated with the artist. Uh, but the artist was already developed. Durant relates that, quote, perhaps in those years, he painted the gaunt anatomical St. Jerome inscribed to him in the Vatican Gallery. It was probably Leonardo who, toward 1474, painted the colorful and immature Annunciation of the Uffizi. A week before Leonardo's 24th birthday, Leonardo and three other youths were summoned before a committee of Florentine judges to answer a charge of having had homosexual relations. This was rather unusual because homosexuality in Florence was all over the place, was very common. So there was something more to this than meets the eye. On June 4th, 1476, the accusation was repeated. The committee imprisoned Leonardo briefly, released him, and dismissed the charge as unproved. In spite of this, uh, he was given another commission. Everything was forgotten. I think, frankly, they were out to get the fathers. I think there was something going on there, because he was very rich. He probably made a few enemies. It was very easy to make enemies in, in, in Middle East, uh, Asia, the Florence, the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the people who ran uh, Florence were uh, men who loved culture and loved art, but they were very ruthless when they fought among themselves. And, there was no you know, problem for him to bump off anybody who was an enemy. It should be noted that although it is widely assumed that Leonardo was gay, there was no definite proof of his homosexuality, contrary to Durant's point of view. Art historians have pointed to various features of his drawings and his writings that might indicate that he was attracted to men, and it has often been noted that there is no record of any woman in Leonardo's life. While it was well known that he always seemed to be surrounded by strikingly handsome young men, but even though uh, there were many openly homosexual, successful Laurentine artists in the Renaissance. Leonardo was as secretive about his sexuality as he was about other aspects of his personal life. But subsequent to his acquittal of the charge of sodomy, Leonardo was invited to accept a studio in the Medici Gardens. And in 1478, the Medici family asked him to paint an altarpiece for the chapel of St. Bernard in the Palazzo Vecchio. For some reason, he did not carry out the assignment. Nevertheless, he was soon given another commission, which was to paint full length two men hanged for the company uh, conspiracy to murder Lorenzo and Giuliani de Michi. Leonardo, with his half morbid interest in human uh, deformity and suffering, may have felt some fascination in the gruesome task. Although he's a rather peaceful guy, but he was so interested in, in warfare and death. In 1483, Leonardo moved to Milan, probably invited to the court of Ludovico Sforza for his musical ability. He played the lute very beautifully, but Leonardo went beyond the purpose of this invitation and offered his services in the design and construction of instruments of war and of peace. It was during this employment as painter and engineer at the Sforza court that Leonardo's technical inventiveness came into full bloom. The duties of an artist at a Renaissance court included besides painting portraits, designing pageants and festivities, a variety of small engineering jobs that demanded unusual ingenuity and skills in the handling of materials. Leonardo's many creative talents were perfectly suited for this. He invented a large number of astonishing devices during this time, which brought him considerable fame. And many of these inventions were extraordinary for the period. Among them were doors that opened and closed automatically by means of counterweights a table lamp with a variable intensity, folding furniture, and up to the octagonal mirror that generated an infinite number of multiple images, and an ingenious spit in which to roast uh, slowly or fast, depending on, on whether the fire is moderate or strong. Other inventions of a more industrial nature, whether the fire is moderate or strong, other inventions of more industrial nature include a press for making olive oil and a variety of textile machines for spinning, weaving, trimming felt and making needles. Leonardo remained an avid inventor throughout his life. The total number of inventions attributed to him has been estimated at 300. But this combination of artist engineer was not unusual in the Renaissance. Leonardo's teacher, Veracchio, Veracchio, for example, was a renowned goldsmith, sculptor, and a painter, as well as a reputable engineer. The great Renaissance uh, architect, Brunelleschi, was trained as a goldsmith and first gained notice in Florence as a sculptor. 
what made Leonardo unique as a as an uh, engineer and designer, however, was that many of the novel designs he presented in his notebooks involved technological advances that would not be realized until several centuries later. And secondly, he was the only man among the famous Renaissance engineers who made the transition from engineering to science, like painting, engineering became a mental discourse for him. To know how something worked was not enough for, for Leonardo. He, he also needs to know why. Thus, an inevitable process was set in motion, which led him from technology and engineering to pure science. As an art, uh, as an historian, Kenneth Clark notes, quote, we can see the process at work in Leonardo's manuscripts. First, there are questions about the construction of certain machines, first, uh, and then questions about the principles of dynamics, and finally, questions which had never been asked before about winds, clouds, the age of the earth, generation, the human heart, Mere curiosity has become profound scientific research, independent of, of the technical interests which had preceded it. Leonardo remained in Milan for 16 years, employed by Schwarzer on all kinds of artistic and engineering work. His notebooks copiously illustrated in his own head, describing in great detail the machines and devices he invented, which show the incredible resourcefulness of his mind. And from the period of his stay at Milan came the idea of suburban cities with a population of 30,000 to relieve the crowded conditions of Milan itself. Elaborate plans for drawing swampy regions along the Po River, the construction of aqueducts to supply Milan with needed water, and through highways into and out of the city. In May 1499, French forces entered Italy. Of course, at that time, Italy was not a country that made up a lot of city-states that were fighting among themselves. On September 14, Milan fell without a shot fired. The Italian political elite fled, and on October 6, Louis XII entered the city in triumph. He remained there about six weeks. Leonardo initially remained uh, hope, evident hoping to curry favor with the French, by now Leonardo was known internationally. Few leaders would not have relished the chance to have such a man as an adornment of the court. The French greatly admired his work. If Leonardo could have remained in Milan with the same deal from the new regime that had, he had from the old, he might have stayed. But Louis returned to France, and the French troops began to mistreat the population. On December 14, Leonardo transferred his savings to a bank in Florence and prepared to depart with uh, his companion, Salai, and his friend, uh, Luca Pacioli. Subsequent to his departure, Leonardo spent a while in Venice, where he gave advice on how the city might be defended against the Turks. He went to Florence after an absence of 18 years, and there's always fighting going on, not among the cities, uh, but also with other countries, uh, Turkey, France, and so forth. Uh, Leonardo, uh, in uh, the next few years, in, in 1503 to 1506, he was in the employ of the Republic of Fr Florence, mostly engaged in painting, or consulted for various artistic matters. He found time, however, to survey and designed a canal with locks, which would have taken the water of the Arno from its headwaters to Pisa. Leonardo left sketches for an array of engines of war, some defensive and some offensive, not only to resist invaders, but also attack enemies. By the 15th century, the art of weaponry had been advancing for many years, and some of Leonardo's weapons are derived from earlier times. But many of his drawings are entirely original prefiguring technology of the distant future. On his return to Florence in 1500, Leonardo and his household were guests of the Servite monks at the monastery of Santissima and Anciata, and were provided with a workshop where, according to Vasari, Leonardo created the paintings of the Virgin and Child of St. Diana and St. John the Baptist, a work that won such admiration that men and women, young and old, uh, flocked to see it as if they were attending a great festival. In 1502, Leonardo entered the service of Cesare Borgia, the son of Pope Alexander VI, acting as a military architect and engineer and traveling throughout Italy with his patron. He returned to Florence, where he rejoined the Guild of St. Louvre on October 18, 1503, spent two years designing and painting a great mural of the Battle of Angieri, with Michelangelo designing his companion piece, the Battle of Cassina. In Florence in 1504, Leonardo was part of a committee formed to relocate against the artist's will Michelangelo's statue of David. 
by the way, the two guys met each other, didn't like each other. So I think there was a lot of competition between the two of them. Uh, and if you go to Florence, uh, the big thing is the Statue of David, which was done by Michelangelo. It was, by the way, porous uh, marble, and nobody could really do a good job of it, so they gave it to Michelangelo, who you know, performed so, a great job. Uh, from September 1513 to 1516, Leonardo spent much of his time living in the Belvedere in the Vatican in Rome, where Raphael and Michelangelo were both active at the time. In October 1515, Francis I of France recaptured the land. December 1915, Leonardo was presented at, was present at the meeting of Francis I and Pope Leo X, which took place in Bologna. It was for Francis that Leonardo was commissioned to make a mechanical lion which could walk forward and open his chest to reveal a cluster of lilies. In 1516, he entered Francis' service, being given the use of the manor house, Close Luce, near the king's residence at the royal chateau in Bois. It was here that Leonardo spent the last three years of his life, accompanied by his friend and apprentice, Count Francisco Melzi, supported by a pension totaling 10,000 scudi. Leonardo died at Close Luce, France, on May 2nd, 1519. Uh, Francis I had become a close friend, and Vasari records that the king held Leonardo's head in his arms as he died, although this story, beloved by the French and portrayed in various romantic paintings, may be legend rather than a fact. Vasari also tells us that in his last days, Leonardo uh, sent for a priest to make his confession, to receive the holy sacrament in accordance to his will. Sixty beggars followed his casket. He was buried in the chapel of St. Hubert in the castle of Amboise. Melzi was the principal heir and executor, receiving as well as money Leonardo's paintings, tools, library, and personal effects. Leonardo also remembered his other longtime student and companion, Salai, and his servant, Battista de Vellusi, who each received half of Leonardo's vineyards, his brothers who received land, and his serving woman, who received a black hope of good stuff with a fur edge. And some years after Leonardo's death, Francis re was reported by the goldsmith and sculptor Benvenuti Cellini as saying, quote, there had never been another man born in the world who knew as much as Leonardo, unquote. Will Durant admires Leonardo, but dismisses him in his book, The Greatest Minds and Ideas of All Times. He does, however, point out that Leonardo uh, is the voice and symbol of the Italian Renaissance, that he was a painter, musician, sculptor, architect, and Thomas, physiologist, inventor, engineer, and mathematician, among other disciplines. But unfortunately, our definitions and criteria excluded him. He was an artist primarily, and only secondarily a philosopher or a scientist. It is by his Last Supper and his Mona Lisa that we remember him, and not by his therapy of fossils or his anticipation of Harvey or his majestic vision of universal and everlasting law. Uh, personally, I don't agree with Durant on that, I think. And just being able to uh, uh, be so eclectic and so uh, prescient about different things uh, makes him a genius in my mind. Anyway. Since the Leonardo, Leonardo contrary to Durant is widely viewed as the archetype of a genius, it is interesting to ask ourselves what we mean by that term. On what grounds are we justified in calling uh, Leonardo a genius, and how does he compare with other ones as scientists known as geniuses? During Leonardo's time, the term genius did not have a modern meaning of a, personal, a person endowed with extraordinary intellectual or creative powers. The Latin word genius originated in Roman religion, where it denoted the spirit of the gens, the family. It was understood as a guardian spirit, first associated with individuals and then also with peoples and places. The extraordinary achievements of artists or scientists were attributed to the genius or attendant spirit. This meaning of genius was prevalent throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. In the 18th century, the meaning of the word changed to its familiar modern meaning to denote these individuals themselves, as in the phrase, Newton was a genius. Regardless of the term used, the fact that certain individuals possessed exceptional and inexplicable creative powers beyond the reach of ordinary mortals was recognized throughout the ages. It was often associated with divine inspiration especially in connection with poets. For example, in the 12th century, the German abyss and mystic Hildegard von Bingen was famous throughout Europe as a naturalist, composer, visual artist, poet, and playwright. She herself, however, took no credit 
for the amazing range and depth of her talents, but commented simply that she was, quote, a feather on the breath of God, unquote. In the Italian Renaissance, the association of exceptional creative powers with divine inspiration was expressed in a very direct way by bestowing on those individuals the epithet divino, or divino. Among the Renaissance masters, Leonardo, as well as his younger contemporaries, Raphael and Michelangelo, were claimed as divine. Since the development of modern psychology, neuroscience, and genetic research, there's been a lively discussion about the origins, mental characteristics, and genetic makeup of geniuses. However, numerous studies of well-known historical figures have shown a bewildering diversity of hereditary psychological and cultural factors, defying all attempts to establish some common pattern. While Mozart was a famous child prodigy, Einstein was a late bloomer. Newton attended a prestigious university, whereas Leonardo was essentially self-taught. He and his parents were well-educated and of high social standing, but Shakespeare seemed to have been relatively undistinguished, and the list goes on. Despite this wide range of backgrounds, psychologists have been able to identify a set of mental attributes that seem to be distinctive signs of genius, in addition to exceptional talent in a particular field. All these were characteristics of the Leonardo to a very high degree. The first is an intense curiosity and great enthusiasm for discovery and understanding. This was indeed an outstanding quality of Leonardo, whom Kenneth Clark called the most relentlessly curious man in history. Another striking sign of genius is an extraordinary capacity for intense concentration over long periods of time. Isaac Newton apparently was able to hold the mathematical problem in his mind for weeks until it surrendered to his mental powers. When asked how he made his remarkable discoveries, Newton is reported to have replied, I keep the subject constantly before me and wait until the first dawnings open, little by little, into the full light. Leonardo seems to have worked in a very similar way, and most of the time not only on one, but on several problems simultaneously. We have a vivid testimony of Leonardo's exceptional powers of concentration from his contemporary Matteo Bandello, who described how, as a boy, he watched Leonardo paint The Last Supper. He would see uh, Leonardo arrive early in the morning. Bandello tells us to climb up on the scaffolding and immediately start to work. He sometimes stayed there from dawn to sundown, never putting down his brush, forgetting to eat and drink, painting without pause. He would also sometimes remain two, three, or four days without touching his brush, although he spent several hours a day standing in front of the work, arms folded, examining and criticizing the figures to himself. He goes on to say, I also saw him driven by some sudden urge at midday when the sun was at its height, leaving the court vecchio where he was working on his marvelous clay horse to come straight to Santa Maria del Grassi without seeking shade and clamber up onto the scaffolding, pick up a brush, put in one or two strokes, and then go away again, unquote. Kind of unusual. Closely associated with the powers of intense concentration, that are characteristic of geniuses seems to be their ability to memorize large amounts of information in the form of a coherent whole, a single crystal. Newton kept mathematical proofs he had derived from months in his mind before eventually writing them down and publishing them. Byrne is said to have entertained his fellow passengers on long coast journeys by reciting his novels to them word for word before committing them to paper. And then there's a famous story of Mozart, who was a child wrote out a perfect, a no perfect score of Gregorio Allegri's Miserere, a complex chant for a five-part choir after he, hearing it only once. Leonardo would follow people with striking facial features for hours, memorize their appearance, and then draw them when he was back in the studio, reportedly with complete accuracy. The Milanese painter and writer Giovanni Pablo Lomasso tells a story how Leonardo once wished to paint some peasants laughing Quote, he chose certain men whom he thought appropriate for his purpose, and after getting acquainted with them, arranged a feast for them with some of his friends. Sitting close to them, he then proceeded to tell the maddest and most ridiculous tales imaginable, making them who were unaware of his intentions to laugh uproariously. Whereupon he observed all of his gestures very attentively and what they were doing, and impressed them on his mind. And after they had left, he retired to his room and then made a perfect drawing, which moved those who looked at it to laughter as if they had been moved by Leonardo's stories at the feast. 
Let us look at the concept of creativity. I think all of us in this room have some are creative in different ways. But creativity is some sort of mental activity, an insight that occurs inside the heads of some special people, however. And this short assumption may be misleading. If by creativity we mean an idea or action that is new and valuable, though we cannot simply accept uh, a person's own account as a criterion for existence, there's no way to know whether a thought is new except with reference to some standards. There's no way to tell whether it is valuable until it passes social evaluation. Therefore, creativity does not happen inside people's heads, but in the interaction between a person's thoughts in a socio-cultural context, which is systemic, is systemic, it is a systemic rather than an individual phenomenon. For example, creativity with a capital C, the kind of changes some expect, some aspect of the culture is never only in the mind of a person. That would, by definition, this should not be a case of cultural creativity. To have an effect, the idea must be couched in terms that are understandable to others. It must, it must pass muster with the experts in the field. And finally, it must be included in the cultural domain to which it belongs. So the first question one may ask of creativity, creativity is not what it is it, but where is it? Um, Macaulay, I think his name is Macaulay, uses the words domain to describe a set of symbolic rules and procedures such as mathematics, which is quote, vested in what we usually call culture, the symbolic knowledge shared by a particular society or by humanity as a whole. And the second component of creativity is the field, which includes all the individuals who act as gatekeepers. So basically, it's really an interaction between the creative person and the people in the community. Um, the third component of the creative system is the individual person. Creativity occurs when a person uses the symbols of a given social creative system, such as music, engineering, literature, science, business, or mathematics, has a new idea or sees a new pattern. And when this novelty is selected by the appropriate system for inclusion into the relevant subculture, it becomes known as creative. The next generation will encounter that novelty as part of the culture they're exposed to. And if they are, they are creative, they in turn will change it further. Uh, in the 15th and 16th century, there was a great spur in artistic creativity that took place in Florence, Italy. How can this flowering of great art be explained? The creativity is something entirely within a person who would have to argue that for some reason an unusually large number of creative artists were born in Florence. As far as the social creative system is concerned, the Renaissance in Italy, particularly in Florence, was made possible in part by the rediscovery of ancient Roman methods of building and sculpting that had been lost for centuries during the so-called Dark Ages. In Rome and elsewhere, by the end of the 1300s, eager scholars were excavating classical rules copying down and analyzing the styles and techniques of the ancients. This slow preparatory work bore fruit at the turn of the 15th century, opening up long forgotten knowledge to the artists and craftsmen of the time. But no matter how influential the rediscovery of classical art forms, the Florentine Renaissance cannot be explained only in terms of the sudden availability of information. Otherwise, the same flowering of new artistic forms would have taken place in all the other cities exposed to the ancient models. And though this actually did happen to a certain extent, no other place matched Florence in the intensity and depth of artistic achievement. And why is this so? The explanation is that the field of art became particularly favorable to the creation of new works at just about the same time as the rediscovering of the ancient artifacts of art. Florence had become one of the richest cities of Europe, first through trading, then through the manufacture of wool and other textiles, and finally through the financial expertise of its rich merchants. By the end of the 14th century, there were, there were a dozen major bankers in the city, the Medici family being only one of the minor ones, who were getting substantial interest every year from the various foreign kings and potentates to whom they had to lend money. But while the coffers of the bankers were getting fuller, the city itself was troubled. Men without property were ruthlessly exploited, and political tensions fueled by economic inequality threatened at any moment to explode into open conflict. To make matters worse, Florence was surrounded by Siena, Pisa, and Arezzo, cities jealous of its wealth and ambitions, and always ready to snatch away whatever they could of Florentine trade and territory. It was in this atmosphere of wealth and uncertainty that the urban leaders decided to invest in making Florence the most beautiful city in Christendom. In these words, a new, a new Athens. By building awesome churches, impressive bridges, splendid palaces, 
and by commissioning great frescoes uh, and majestic statues, they must have felt that they were wearing a protective spell around their homes and businesses. And in a way, they were not wrong. When more than 500 years later, Hitler ordered the retreating German troops to blow up the bridges on the Arno and level the city around them, the field commander refused to obey on the grounds that too much beauty would be erased from the world and the city was safe. Within the sociocultural environment of the Italian Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci was born and thrived for much of his life. He evolved as a painter, a craftsman, inventor, musician, and philosopher. He was the most multifaceted of all the great Renaissance artists and also the most mysterious. Though celebrated for centuries for his momentous achievements, the man himself has remained curiously elusive much of his life in shadow. In this paper, I attempted to trace Leonardo's remarkable journey from his obscure beginnings as a child out of wedlock in the village of Vinci on the outskirts of Florence and through his apprenticeship in the Florentine workshop of Veraccio, his years of service within the power families of Renaissance Italy, Medicia, Sforza, Borgia, his relationship with Michelangelo and other giants of culture and art, his fame as one of the most illustrious figures of his age and his final days in the service of Francis I of France. In art, Leonardo's works are few, too few even for a part-time artist, but they include the two most famous paintings in history, <clears throat> the most copied works in all of art, which we know as the Mona Lisa and the uh, Last Supper. Thus, even with an extremely modest output, he elevated art to a different level. And in a field in which quality counts far more than quantity, he is most certainly a transformative artist. As a scientist, Leonardo was practicing geology before the field was invented. His anatomical drawings had not been equal. He made pronouncements on evolution. His studies in gravitation puts him under the same intellectual umbrella as Galileo, Newton, and Einstein. He conceived the notion of a flying machine, parachute, submarine, and the tank. He designed a machine gun, armored car, other futuristic weapons. The list is endless, but three quarters of the original notebooks are missing. Although he prefigured myriad scientific discoveries, he failed to publish them. If these all had been disseminated and taken to the next level by the generations of artists, of scientists who followed, we might have, have arrived at a level of scientific sophistication centuries earlier. Thus, he cannot be considered a transformer of artists according to many scholars. But like Mozart and Beethoven in music composition, Leonardo was a perfectionist, toiling on the minute de details of his creations. It was never effortless, but really was it not perfect. His Last Supper, <clears> or <throat> Mona Lisa, is so great an achievement that it must be compared to supreme achievements in other fields, to Newton's Principia, Principia Einstein's theory of general, general uh, relativity, and Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, creations that elevate the human spirit and make it unimaginably richer. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Just a comment about Leonardo uh, being secretive about his incredible ideas. You know he wrote uh, with mirror writing, so no one could read his notebooks. He was left-handed, of course, but he didn't like that idea of being left-handed because if you were left-handed in the Renaissance or even in the Middle Ages, that was a bad sign. You were part, you were not light. And of course he was totally afraid that not only would others steal his ideas, but the Catholic Church would come after him with the Inquisition. Just as they did with Galileo. <coughs> and just as they did with the others that were burned at the stake. I'm thinking of one called Bruno. I forgot yeah. his last name. And no. No, he was burned at the stake for his ideas okay. in the turn of the century. Right. And um, that's why he was afraid. Mm -hmm. Now, he had protection, of course. The others knew about his genius. Right. And of course, the Medici always supported anyone who was as brilliant as he. And, uh, you know, they were always out looking for making sure that Leonardo was protected, yeah. even in the case with the, the sodomy. Right. So that's why I wanted to just point that out. Yes. 
In your study of Leonardo's life, mm -hmm. did you find anything in his psychodynamics that might have led him or moved him to paint the Mona Lisa, like the search for his birth mother? Well, it, I think there was always contact with the birth mother. I think at the end of his life, in fact, he took her in, I believe, to try to help her because she was dying. So she was always there. I don't know. Uh, it, you know a lot of scholars say that she was not very nurturing, she was not involved, you know. But uh, I think. I have a feeling he was involved with that. And I think the Mona Lisa might have symbolized uh, his mother. But the Mona Lisa is very enigmatic, the yes. smile and all that. So there may be something there in terms of his own quest for some kind of eternal uh, nurturing, which he never really, I don't, know, I don't think he got too much of it. But uh, there's a theory that he was gay because he didn't have the eternal nurturing. Uh, I don't know how true that is. He was secret in those. I mentioned about his sexuality also. But I think uh, she did have an influence whether she was there or not. No question about it. I think she reflected those paintings. But I just wasn't there some talk that Mona Lisa was a boy? I mean, that, and, and, yeah. and that's right. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what, who was that boy? If it was a boy, boy, girl. Um, that's all part of the mystery. That's all part of the history, right? Yeah. yeah. There was also a painting uh, with uh, John the Baptiste, very feminine painting. Yes. Uh, I mean, it was very androgynous. So, you know, uh, he was, you know, I think he was a very complex guy, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. There were good reasons for him to maybe to be secretive, as you mentioned. Uh, mm. uh, because uh, just looking, you know, I think he took bodies out of the grave. This was a, uh, mm. He could have been killed. I mean, he could have been drawn and quartered for doing something like that. Yes. But what's interesting, they loved him. Everybody who knew him loved him, and the royalty, <coughs> and the Medici thought he was the greatest. And you know, he was dealing with people who uh, were pretty ruthless. So they, uh, he was their favorite boy. He was know. a likable guy. He was. He, there was something bad. He was likable from yeah. what we gather. Uh -huh. He had a great group of uh, young men who followed him around, and he was viewed as a master. You know, and they tried to emulate him. But it's interesting, his main competitor in culture was Michelangelo, who I think was probably jealous of his popularity to some extent. Florence is, uh, when you think of Florence, you think of the statue of David, you know, you don't think too much about him at all. But he had a big influence. Any other questions, comments? Yes? Um, what do you suppose the connection was between his great scientific achievements and mathematical achievement and his painting, because you said that creativity is in the mind, mm -hmm. and you put it in a socio-economic, socio-cultural context. So there's a marriage there, and, and you mentioned that because he he did very few paintings, but the drawings were voluminous. Right. Um, he, he saw himself, to great extent, as a mathematician. Uh, he was very mathematical in the way he saw things. I think we, we can't eliminate the fact that uh, uh, there was Arabic influence at that time, though it's not always mentioned in the, in the books, but they, uh, they were very much into math, and uh, it wasn't just Aristotle, I think. It was, uh, Arabic, it was a high Arabic culture that were into science at that time. But uh, they were very much into math, and I think it was influenced by that, by them also. His drawings were very detailed uh, around the uh, anatomy of human beings. And uh, as I said, he did uh, take out cadavers, and, uh, study them, and try to understand uh, how people move and uh, so forth and so on. It's sort of a shame that in, in, in art courses, that in the teaching of the work of Leonardo and of his supposed life, because we don't know that much about it, that they do not put the artwork as another facet of a man who obviously was a kind of multiple personality person. And if they did, we wouldn't be stuck culturally with this you know, split between the left and right brain, mm -hmm. that uh, that more artists would understand that it's possible also to study mathematics. Oh, yeah. I sure. mean, just culturally, we really are hindering ourselves 
by not allowing that that, that union to take place, and I think it's still um, a very large part of the educational system that it's not recognized in planning <laughs> curriculum right. that uh, they eliminate all the art programs. That's the first to go, and no one understands that there is a connection in the thinking of the artist that allows them to also think scientifically mm -hmm. and mathematically, and, and the reverse is true. Yeah. Um, and That's a very good point. Mm -hmm. If you're a musician, you also have to be think somewhat mathematically. Yeah. 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 I think maybe a lot of it has to do with the teaching of uh, math. The people who teach it too effectively, I think kids get turned off. Um, uh, it's more of an attitude. I think it's a cultural. It could be a cultural. A cultural stereotypical, yeah. very narrow-minded um, attitude right. that, that you know you have to be one thing and well, that's other, it. Well, I remember many years ago reading an article on why lawyers and social workers don't get along. Lawyers are left brain and social workers are right brain, according to the article. You know. But that may not, that may be a simpli simplification. That's you know. probably true. Yeah, well, there is some degree of truth to that. <laughs> some lawyers are, are, are social workers and vice versa, too. So. Right. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I just would like to make. Uh, a statement about Leonardo's techniques. Uh, Leonardo wrote everything down, of course, and he invented or reinvented a technique based on chiaroscuro, which means light and shadow. And light and shadow is basically a way to reach three-dimensional form which had disappeared for 800 years uh, from the Byzantine tradition, which was totally linear and decorative and religious. Well, Leonardo, with another technique called sfumato, based on atmospheric perspective, which from a distance makes everything extremely foggy because he had observed this as a child, that things from far away, gee, they look blue, mountains aren't blue, but he made them that way in his background painting of the Mona Lisa. He didn't use blue, Mona Lisa was totally done on a step-by-step -step basis, like he did everything, starting from drawings, which were linear, sketches, just like you would solve a mathematical problem or diagram a sentence, you had to do that with the object in front of you. And then finally, step by step, the light and the shadow, chiaroscuro. And using that technique and sfumato, whoa, you've got three-dimensionality in the middle of the 15th century where everything was flat. Yeah. If you teach this technique, which I have for so many years, yeah. to people, they will understand it. Mm -hmm. But you have to start with linearity first. And then you go into form. And it also helps if you sculpt. Yeah. Because then you're dealing with three-dimensional form. Which and he then, did. Yeah, which he did. Yeah. Because they all did. Yeah. Michelangelo drew, mm -hmm. even though he didn't like drawing and painting. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was forced, of course, to paint the Sistine ceiling, right. uh, which was done with fresco. Mm -hmm. Leonardo worked with different media. At that time, in the 15th century, mm -hmm. people were beginning to understand oil painting. Mm -hmm. The Germans in the north had discovered Jan van Eyck, mm -hmm. wonderful technique of using layers and layers and building it up so that the form looks three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. This is the beginning right. of that led totally to photography right. and our obsession with three-dimensional form. That is why he's an artistic genius. Yeah, that's a very interesting mm -hmm. point.
He was also, I believe, into like, studying the countryside, looking at birds. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much into that. Oh, yeah. He took so, everything apart. It may have been uh, his mother's influence. He was a peasant mm -hmm. who lived on a farm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, interesting, very interesting man. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.